that was that was a pretty good pretty good segue into dynamic correspondence talking about charlie that uh <laughs> well and it's ironic right because i i and again i, I don't want to speak for charlie but charlie and even james smith i think that they would agree that like the more general the weight training the better like i i've i've heard james say like racks don't need tendo units right yeah because the barbell is a means for strength our power work is going to be sprinting, throwing, and jumping. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that's a, that's a reasonable take. And that's something that, like, if, if I were to talk to either of them, um, that I would ask them for more clarity on. You've probably talked to James a lot more frequently than I have. So my, my pushback on some of these things, now, again, like, when I coached, when I trained Devin McCourty and he was the fastest guy in the NFL that year at like 30, 31 years old, we did all general shit. We sprinted, we didn't jump and we threw some med balls and then we just did general lifting stuff. We even did slow eccentrics, right? But he felt good and he felt like him. And that was the most important thing for him to be able to express his abilities. Uh, there are instances where could I have done it better? And I think the answer is yes. So like you, 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 you talked about one of your posts, uh, the triple jump and the forces associated with that, right? Forces. And, and yeah. And, but what's power power is force times velocity, right? So they're going really, really fast and having really, really high force, which means they're, generating tons and tons of power or expressing tons of power. Well, my once my NFL guys get between three, four years in the league, they can't jump anymore other than box jumps. So the landing is just too much for them. So we can't really do too much power expression other than sprinting and throwing. So it leaves something gone from, from our equation. So that's where that's where measuring velocity, bar speed, and all that can become an expression of power in a safe way because it's surprisingly less stressful on their ankles and knees and hips sometimes. So are you not are you not using isometrics frequently? Depends. Uh, it, it depends. So my my NFL crew, I'll get them before OTAs for a maximum of twelve weeks, maximum, and then I'll get them after OTAs before camp. Uh, for maybe four weeks. So I need to put 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag, right? Like I don't, I don't have a lot of time with these guys. So I'll do this year. I did an incredibly complex program where we did acceleration work on Mondays and Fridays. Uh, Brooker and Rolf were actually on the phone when I, when I was putting all this together, they were help walking me through it. And then on our, on one day, we'd, we would do uh, fast, like very, very fast, 2.2 meter per second squats, supersetted with jumps, but then we couldn't do the jumps. We couldn't do the pogo jumps as superset because it was just too much stress on their joints after especially doing all the acceleration work or any higher end speed work. And we would do a Kaiser power or the Kaiser sprinter where we do like three sets of five maximum power, maximum watts. And then as our supplemental work, one day we would do eccentric. Then the other day we would do isometric. And our eccentric would be, I don't know, one set of six second negatives, three to six reps. And then the next the next day uh, would be, actually our earlier in the week, it would be the uh, isometric. We'd do more of a uh, 10 second iso for heavy, 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 heavy weight to be able to express strength as quickly as possible, you know? And we did that for two weeks. And then I did uh, speed step ups for a week or two as well. And then they're gone. Yeah. So I, I, I guess, I mean, I guess the only difference is in some of the programming that I've, I've been doing is um, working in some split runs um, for quote unquote speed endurance and much longer ISOs and much longer eccentrics. 
and then a lot of um, faster eccentrics. So, um, I mean, you, you probably know all this. So, I mean, if this is, is something that you already know, just tell me, shut up and we'll move on. But no, keep going, um, keep <clears throat> like I have the unfortunate pleasure of sometimes doing a fair amount of rehab. Right. And so what, what really got me interested in isometrics was this concept of like stress shielding and then stress relaxation. Right. So, okay. In a, in a injured tendon, right. We, we assume that, um, like the middle of the, uh, imagine a road and there's a car accident in the middle of the road and those cars just stay there. And then everybody starts going around those cars. Right. Um, the tendon then as it has to kind of deal with force is just distributing it away from the injured portion. Right. And so where the isometrics come into play is those longer duration isometrics, like 30 seconds or, or longer, um, they provide stress relaxation. And so the, the healthier part of the tendon relaxes. And then the, uh, the injured portion then has to deal with that force, which then allows it to start to rebuild um, and, you know, like get that the collagen aligned, the direction of the collagen, the way that we need it, how the collagen is um, cross-linked and get that, get that person stronger again. Right. And so tendons are unique because it's, muscle to tendon, tendon to bone, whereas ligaments are just bone to bone, right? And so um, like with girls, you know, you just want ligaments to be as stiff as possible. And in girls during their menstrual cycle, and this is again, more of like a hypothesis, we, we see like estrogen, progesterone, relaxin, the way that those are all kind of intertwined, they tend to have more ACL tears, like four to eight times more than guys, right? Because of laxity in the ligaments. Whereas men tend to have a little bit more non-contact muscle pulls because we get in a situation with testosterone where sometimes the tendons become stiffer than the muscles are strong, right? So um, I've been using more yielding isometrics like very early on in like GPP and accumulation to number one, help those athletes that are having some tendon issues. Number two, to be able to strengthen specific positions that athletes are weaker in, whereas normally we're kind of just working ranges that athletes are already kind of strong. Um, it ends up being pretty good for conditioning. We get co-contraction around the joint, which is good for stability. We see that so like if the isometric is the bridge between the concentric and the eccentric, by improving that, and this again would be more of like a theory, there's definitely, there should be an enhanced coupling effect and, and it should be a more um, efficient process when we're doing more dynamic work, right? Um, so we, we want that tendon to be a little bit stiffer. We see that a stiffer tendon is going to lead to like usually a little bit greater rate of force development. Um, so I've been using the ISOs a lot more frequently, like even in, in some cases daily with people just because they're the least like um, uh, the least damaging of the of the three contractions. Right. So um, you can use them more frequently and then the slower eccentrics like have you done have you used any eqis eccentric quasi isometrics yeah 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 and i and i've been using those too and those again almost end up being like conditioning for that tissue too because we're talking about a 30 second iso and then a 30 second eccentric following that almost 60 seconds of work right and the whole the whole goal of gpp or in accumulation phase is like we have to make sure that the surrounding tissue and musculature is in a place where it can transfer energy efficiently and effectively. And if we like bypass, bypass that, um, like what we'll see with like that stress shielding is like your, your body will just try to protect that tissue. And even in your dynamic movements, it'll just keep going around it, keep going around it. And then that's when we like really get into trouble. Um, 
it was really cool. And then I'll, I'll shut up for a second. Uh, I, I, I think his name was Keith Barr. They put a, um, a mouse in a boot for three days. And not only was there a, re there was no injury actually, not only was there a reduction in muscle mass, but there was a loss of tendon collagen and they started to see tendinopathy in three days after being immo immobilized for three days. Um, and so like, you know, then when we have athletes that are just prescribed rest, right? Well, all that ends up happening is the tendon load loading capacity decreases and then they go back to these dynamic movements and they're kind of fucked. Right. So, um, I, I, you know, I've been using them a lot more frequently early, early on in my programming. And with the older guys, like I have a couple older guys in the PLL right now, um, who, who we've been using a lot of ISOs in season too, and they're responding very well to it. Um, not saying that that's like the only way to do it, the, the best way to do it, but, but we seem to be having pretty good response there. Yeah. So there's, there's two ways that I utilize isometrics. Um, I'll couple them with aerobic strength work where I have in my early GPP phase, we'll do extended ISOs. We'll do like 30, 40 second ISOs. And they're always, you know, I mean, we always, we always have planks as part of our, part of our warm up, but you know, they'll do, they'll do 30, 40 second isometrics. And like you said, for work capacity purposes, uh, and just for building up the tissue in a pretty, pretty safe environment, like, are you going to fucking pull something if you're sitting still, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. And I'll couple it with what I call strength aerobics, which is like a three second down, three second up. 40 seconds on, 20 seconds off, multiple series, multiple reps, uh, different, you know, you'll do a push, you'll do a pull, you'll do a lunge, you'll do a hinge sort of thing or a hip thrust, whatever the hell. And I early on, we do longer isometrics and then I switch from aerobic to eccentric and then I'll go right back to heavy isometrics where we'll do... Uh, a 20 second, then a 10 second isometric. And then the 10 second, once you get to that point and you start loading up the ISOs for short duration, I look at isometrics as a realization of strength. So just like Charlie said, maximum strength only works for four, eight weeks before you, you, you peak. You're not developing strength during those phases, right? Like even during the isometric, you're not developing it during a heavy isometric phase. All you're doing is realizing your ability to contract those motor units associated with it. It's like doing the stim. Stim only works for the four weeks because then that's how quick it takes for your body to adapt to be able to neurally recruit those motor units. That's how I look at a lot of the isometrics. Now, if you have guys that are just such low work capacity, that's why you do it early on in the training. Um, the the long duration isometrics, uh, the prolonged isometrics I've seen, and I've 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 used it with guys that have any kind of ten tendinopathy, right? Because what does that do? That gets the motor units firing, so it takes because if if the muscle isn't firing, the motor units aren't 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 working properly. The tendon has to create the energy or take over majority of the energy. So. What do the isos do? The isos are sitting there. It fatigues all the surrounding musculature. And then once that fatigues, then the shitty musculature has to come in and like start doing its fucking job. And now all of a sudden, wow, the tendon can relax and, and do what it's supposed to do. Does that make sense? Did I explain that right? Yeah. So that's like the, the creep or the stress relaxation, right? Um, you know, this is like... And, and again, I, I do believe it's around 30 seconds then where that the healthy part of the tendon relaxes, the muscles working a little harder, and then the tension um, starts to flow through the injured part. And then that's how we start the the rebuilding process. But I, I've been I've been using that even in non-injured people. And then the eccentrics, and this this was was from um, those the sports science coordinator with the Cardinals um, been using some long, like 30 to 40 second eccentrics 
um, which are not enjoyable for your average person. But I actually really enjoy them. Like I, I enjoy performing them um, and then using some of the EQIs as well. And um, again, it's like a short sample size, but I would say that all of my athletes are feeling really good. We haven't had any issues. They're getting relatively strong in, like I said, in disadvantageous positions. Mm -hmm. And they all seem to be playing well. And, and, and those that are in season right now um, with, and I'm using more of the isometrics and even the, the long eccentrics, because those long eccentrics, like you get a lot of impulses throughout there. We're getting like those morphological changes at the muscle tendon unit that we're looking for. Um, it's going a long way. So um, I'm not a tendon expert. You know what I mean? It's just something that's been interesting to me because I do get a lot of athletes that are hurt. And so this concept of like stress shielding and stress relaxation, it's just been interesting for me to kind of look into and read about. Yeah. I, I remember shit when I was still working at the Franco's uh, I had really fucked up my shoulder and it was before I had really ever heard of EQIs. Uh, and I started doing, uh, I, cause I wanted a sweet chest. Like I just wanted my chest to be awesome. But my like, like Arnold, bro, I'd love to. I'd, <laughs> what, what a fucking legend, right? I used to have that same exact photo, shocker, uh, hanging in my uh, my living room of my one bedroom apartment. Yeah, um, I, I had I had it in my apartment too at one point, dude. And and I had like one of those like mosaic type things hanging up. It was so awesome. I loved it. And chicks would come in and be like, "What are you doing?" What is this? <laughs> and then you'd be like, get the fuck out if you don't understand why that's on the wall. <laughs> I wouldn't even bother explaining it. <laughs> so I remember I was trying to get a sweet chest and I couldn't do flies. Like, how the, how the hell are you supposed to get a sweet chest if you can't do flies? So I held with as much weight as I could handle without there being pain in a fly position, but like the closed fly position. And then I just started slowly, slowly opening, slowly opening. Slow. And then I gradually end it, but like maximal contraction while lengthening. And uh, I remember Smitty came up to him and goes, Oh, doing some EQIs, huh? I was like, the fuck's an EQI. This just feels good. It's the only way I could get my fucking chest going, bro. But you no, know, eccentric quasi asymmetric. I was like, Oh, okay. Berkashansky and Sif. Those are the two. That's, that's where it started. Yep. Had no idea. Look at me. I'm like a mini Verkashansky. You really are. You really are. <laughs> it, it, the, the other, the other interesting thing and in that I've been, I've been having like any of the injured athletes or any of the athletes that are a little older in their career, take collagen. Um, because I believe it's at age 25 there's they start to see like a, a reduction in collagen in the tendons and i know they used to think that it wasn't like a very dynamic tissue that didn't like turn over and and, and i guess it actually it, it does but um i i think that the collagen can potentially help um like supplementing with it and so so how many grams you're talking about fred um you know again this is like I have only read of a couple studies on it from 15 to 20 to some people are like pulsing it a couple times a day. Um, I'm, I'm personally using about 20 grams a day. Um, somebody that is like injured or hurt, I might be like, Hey, you know, try, you know, 30 grams a day. And I'm, I'm not promising anything from it, but it's one of those things where it's like, it's not going to hurt. Um, it's it seems to be an area where they're studying it a little bit more frequently and and like i said i believe it's um it's either keith Barr is, is his name um he, he talks about it a lot about using leucine rich protein and using some kind of collagen and then you also need vitamin c with collagen uh, somewhere along the line to kind of stimulate that um collagen production and make sure that 
you're not kind of dipping below where you need to be. So here's here's my broker for you. This is this is where I will eh I haven't seen too much good stuff on collagen. However, what I have seen because I mean what happens? Your your stomach breaks it down and it's just amino acids at that point. So it's just the amino acid profile that that you need. It's not necessarily the collagen. Uh it's it, what you can look at is Knox gelatin. So buying gelatin, actual gelatin is supposed to be good for the collagen development. Um for whatever reason, I don't it, collagen development joints, uh tissue integrity surrounding the joints. I I forget how much. I forget what the study was. I want to say it was like 15 grams uh either pre-workout or post-workout. I have to dig it up and it led to an increased density in uh tendon tissue. Like Real, 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 real quick. I'll look it up and and I'll I'll send it to you. Um, it might be fifteen grams, pre workout, post workout. I don't fucking remember, but it's like just a basic gelatin, like uh, Knox gelatin. That's that's all it fucking was. And dude, that shit is so cheap. You get you go to the supermarket and you could get that unflavored Knox gelatin. You put it in whatever the hell you want. I just used to dry scoop the shit. <clears throat> so I think I found it here. It was five to f- five or fifteen grams of vitamin C enriched gelatin. Vitamin C enriched gelatin, that's what it is. Yeah. And that's why they like the Nox, because that's got vitamin C in it already. Uh yeah. put, can you can you share the screen on that? Let me see. Mm-hmm. Uh multiple participants can share simultaneously. Hey, don't. Yeah, gotta get rid of all that porn. There we go. Vitamin C and rich gelatin supplementation before before intermittent activity augments collagen synthesis. There we go. That's that's what you should check out more so. Because I haven't seen, and I'm not gonna, I, you know, I'm not the fucking researcher sitting here doing the the collagen stuff, but I haven't seen too much good stuff on taking collagen for collagen. Uh, to me. It was like the whole like Fred, you're you're you used to be really, really big into nutrition. I, I mean, how how do you feel about uh uh eating cholesterol and increasing your cholesterol? Um yeah, no, I I, I think that's obviously dietary cholesterol is, is is a lot different than cholesterol in the body. Yeah. Um I, I I look at it like the same concept. And yeah, I mean, I posted, uh, there was a study, um, let me see if I, um, and I have to look at Keith, Keith, um, reference to, he had, he had a study or he had a presentation and he had referenced, um, two, two different areas about, um, supplementing with some kind of collagen and, um, you know, like I said, that's more his area than it yeah. was me. Um, the other, there, there was one study, but it was, it was uh, again against like it showed that training plus collagen peptides increased patellar tendon hypertrophy more than just exercise. You know, any naysayer would be like, well, they didn't, they didn't go up against just protein, and that's like a totally fair um, yeah. assessment. So. Uh, yeah, like I, I, but and this is one of those things where I would be like, look, I don't know if this is like going to help you, um, but I don't think it would hurt you to try. And if it's like, if it's something this easy that we could add that that could potentially help, I, I'm it's like, we might as well try it. I um, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I I totally I think, agree with that. I, I think again, I can try to find the two the two other studies that were referenced before and um, you know, we'll see. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly how it's going to play out in the future, but a couple, I got a couple of people using it right now and um, I haven't seen anything negative with it. So it's a positive. (laughs) You care about the source, Fred, or is it just beef or you don't care if it's also fish? I I've just been using a supplement um i've just been using these collagen peptides and uh i you know again have not i have not looked too too deep into it i i've i 
have had some like tendonitis in my elbow and this 1000% could be placebo, but it was actually started taking this before I had looked into any of the research. Definitely provided a little bit of relief for me. And then I started to read about it. And then I was like, oh, this is great. It's good for my tendonitis. Um, but no, I, I don't, I, I definitely don't know enough about it to be like giving any hardcore recommendations online, which is why it's something that yeah. I've only really discussed with like my in-person people. And again, very open with them. Like, Hey, this is not like a guarantee. There's not a ton of research on this. There's just been so, some recent studies that it could be helpful. So give it a shot if you're interested. Yeah. 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 Totally. Oh, dude, we do that shit all the time. You know, it's like, what the fuck, fuck do I know? Even, even with the gelatin, like this is, bro, have, Brooker, have you heard about like the uh, test, re not test retest, but the, the issue that we're having right now where we can't replicate studies? Well, I, I haven't heard of this in like specifically, but I can only imagine it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So like we see one study on something and then we try to replicate the exact same study and people aren't even able to re replicate it. So I mean, the fact that it's working for this demographic at this specific time, like, yeah, sure. It's not a guarantee. And, and, and you know, it's like the studies don't prove anything. They merely suggest probability. And it's like they suggest probability with that study at that time, with that demographic, you know, at that level. Yep. You know, so, so don't don't I, I wouldn't feel bad about it for a second, Fred. Yeah, no. And I look at. I kind of look at every study and just like kind of assume that it's wrong. Right. Because there's a really good chance that like over time, it probably will be wrong. <laughs> like, and, and that's the whole thing, like even about like, you know, even about uh, Randy and Rolf's approach is like my my guess is they're going to continue to refine their system over time. Right. And it's like it's the the exploration that is where they're going to learn the most and where the system is going to start to make the most sense. So it's like. Um, I'm not always worried about like, okay, you know, is this a hundred percent accurate right now? Like there's a good chance I'm wrong, but like, as I'm on the path of trying to find the right answer, I'm going to learn a lot. And, yeah. um, like, I, I think one of my favorite quotes is that, um, the, somebody that's like a true expert essentially just knows which mistakes <laughs> not to make. And they they've gotten there by just making a shit ton of mistakes. <laughs> so it's like, not, it's not the guy that's never wrong. It's the guy that was not afraid of being wrong like a million times and not like, that's the guy that actually ends up being the expert. So the guy that was wrong all the time, <laughs> that's your true expert, not the guy that thinks that he was never wrong. 